everybody. Thanks. Thanks for attending. I'm going to be talking about the highlights of something just over 10 years of intermittent work on the study of land snails in mainland Portugal. And to some extent, it's my excuse for doing so little botanical work in Portugal over the last 10 years, which was my intention when I moved there. The land snails turned out to be much more interesting than expected. The talk is going to start with a brief introduction to the physical geography of mainland Portugal and move on to a quick summary of the history of discovery of the land snails. And then the main part will consider in succession, in a kind of chron chronological succession, more or less, work on particular genera that I've studied in detail and present some of the main results. And finally, I'll give some general comments on work that's continuing with Portuguese land snails, mainly involving other people or collaborations. Uh, before really getting going, it's also important to mention that a lot of the work was done in collaboration with Geraldine Holyoke, who contributed a lot of hard work and collecting. And smaller parts were done with two Portuguese collaborators, Rui Mendes, who's a very energetic amateur, mapping and recording land and freshwater snails. And initially in the first four or five years of the 10 with Alvaro de Oliveira, another active Portuguese amateur who got to know the land of freshwater snails well. As studies developed and included Spanish material, there was also collaboration with Luis Chueca and Benjamin Gomez who were carrying out DNA sequencing in the University of the Basque Country. And with Sebastian Tor Torres Alba living in Andalusia, who collaborated on various things, but especially on Truncatalina, where he made a mass of material he collected available. Moving on then to the area I'm talking about is just mainland Portugal small country at the southwest corner on the Atlantic seaboard of Europe. I'm not talking at all about Madeira and the Azores, the other part of political Portugal, which have better known, particularly in the case of Madeira, much better known faunas, which are spectacularly rich in endemics. The mainland Portugal fauna is relatively poor, but has turned out to have more endemics than were originally thought, and still more are emerging now with further study. The land area of mainland Portugal is almost identical to that of Ireland, both having just over a thousand 10 kilometer grid squares. But obviously, although it's nearly as wet in parts as Ireland, it's warmer in accordance with the lower latitude and the southern parts have completely different vegetation with more, much more of a Mediterranean aspect. And in fact, the country of mainland Portugal ranges from a Euro-Siberian woodland zone in the far north to almost fully Mediterranean in the south with a whole series of transitions in between. The topography of Portugal is fairly simple with hills and mountains in a lot of the north, mainly lowlands in the south and along the west coast. The rainfall varies fairly dramatically from the extreme northwest in Minho province, which is nearly as wet as parts of southwest Ireland, at least in the winter, to a southeastern extremity bordering Spain in Alentejo that is one of the driest parts of Europe. The driest bit of all, in fact, and the hottest bit is the extreme northeast, which is in rain shadow for most of the year. It's also the coldest bit in the winter, except for the mountains. The highest land is just under 2000 meters here in the Serra de Strel, with a tower on its summit actually passing the 2000 meter mark. And various other mountains in the north get up to above a thousand meters. 
The drainage in the country is mainly by big rivers that flow through Spain to get into Portugal. And these have probably served as the conduits for colonization of Portugal by snails at different times. The biggest of them are the Teio, which comes out at, at Lisbon here and crosses two thirds of Spain to get there. The Daro with a very long course in Spain, a shorter one, the Minho in the north. And then various rivers with catchments entirely within Portugal. The geology is quite significant for the study of land snails because there is very little limestone and that strictly confined to certain regions. On this geology map, the blues and greens on the coastal plain here include a lot of limestone stretching from about Coimbra down to Lisbon with a big outlier in the Sierra de, Sierra de Rabida here. And then there are more limestones in the Algarve and otherwise only tiny fragments, little hills here and there in West Alentejo and bits of very hard and rather unproductive marble in Northeast Alentejo. Nearly all of the rest, all of the greys and the pinks and these pale greens are Paleozoic rocks, very old sediments, very old metamorphosed sediments or metamorphosed igneous rocks, mainly acid, mainly very unproductive for snails. Moving on to the history of exploration of the mollusks, there was a very good start with Arthur Morley, a, a French nobleman who traveled th through Portugal for several months in the early 1840s, prior to a very, a very auspicious career working with land snails almost worldwide, especially though in Africa and South America. He published a book in 1845, description of the mollusks of the land of fresh water of Portugal, which was a very good start indeed. It named a lot of the common species. It gave good, clear descriptions. It gave reasonable illustrations. The specimens have survived, a lot of them, the type specimens, especially in Paris and at the BM in London. And a good proportion of what he named are still regarded as valid species. And there's not usually much doubt about what he meant by them because the specimens have survived. So there was a very good start. Through the 1860s and 1870s, a Portuguese amateur, Da Silva, produced some very good papers that added additional species, but also rather more synonyms. After that, things took a turn for the worse. Bourgeoignat, the notorious Frenchman who named very many species unnecessarily, got a lot of Portuguese material. Some of it through a young man called Savain, who traveled through Spain and Portugal and published a book in 1892, most of which in fact appears to have been ghost written by Bourgeoignat himself. And then this man, Locar, another disciple of Bourgeoignat's, produced a very big book in 1899 on Portugal, naming a lot more species, which are mainly synonyms, and publishing more on Bourgeoignat's views. And again, it was very much influenced by the so-called Nouvelle École that Bourgeoignat created. The outcome was that the number of valid species of land snail at the end of the 19th century from Portugal was dwarfed by the number of invalid species re represented by synonymous names. It was at this time that the principal figure in the history of Portuguese land snail study, uh, Augusto Nobre made his appearance. He first published in the 1890s and over the following 50 years or so, published on marine mollusks, freshwater mollusks, land mollusks, as well as on reptiles, sea fish, freshwater fish, and a lot of other groups of organisms. His work has been the mainstay for most of the subsequent work within Portugal on land snails. There are three editions of his book on land and freshwater mollusca, the last in 1949, 
And all of them have been alike in taking a very broad species concept. He was rightly appalled by what uh, Savain and Bourgeignat and Lockhart had done, but he went to the other extreme. He produced very broad species concepts. And Portug the study of Portuguese mollusks has been saddled with this for very many years since. And it's only really in recent decades that that has partly been shaken off. For example, he thought that there was one species in the genus Ponentina, a view that has expanded right across Europe. And, that, and he called it subvarescence, which is the name used for the British one. And in fact, that had a range then going from Britain through the Iberian Peninsula to Morocco and Algeria. He only had one species of Truncatellina, which he called Cylindrica, and so on and on. Even with groups where many species were recognized elsewhere in Europe, such as the Zenitidae, as it was Oxychylidae in large part now, he recognized too few species. Finally, in the 1990s, and particularly in 1994 with a new checklist, Rolanda, Albuquerque, Rolanda Maria Albuquerque de Matos took over and revived interest to some extent in the land of freshwater mollusks. She was a genetics professor who studied cornua spursum in detail. And her 1994 checklist was quite influential. It was able to include new work on Portuguese mollusca, particularly by Eddie Gittenberger from the Leiden Museum with some good studies of genera such as Candidula and Plagiarona a de detailed redescriptions of, for example, Portugal, the endemic hygromid, another quite good work. But a lot of groups had not, were not revised, including a lot of what are now the geometridae, the old helicellids. And Professor Albuquerque de Matos, in the end, didn't go far enough in updating the taxonomy, even to the 90, that of the 1970s and 1980s. So, so the legacy of Nobre's work prevailed. In 2008, with Geraldine, I moved to Portugal and we searched for a house and eventually bought one. And while the sale was going through, we explored within central Portugal on various day trips. And one of the species found very early on was a strange keeled helicellid where there was supposed to be no keeled helicellid. And this turned out to be a candidula from its anatomy. And it was eventually named after the type locality at the Valley de Cuda as Candidula cudensis. It was new to science. And it was a bit of a surprise really after making rather small efforts to find something striking and completely new. And that tended to fire up an early interest. Having moved to Portugal by the end of 2009, Alvaro de Oliveira, who was living near Porto made contact, realizing that there are other people interested in snails arriving in Portugal. And he expressed interest in collaborating on some sort of study of Easterphora barbula. It's a brown trisexodontid, about eight to 12 millimeters across, quite common over most of the country, and differs from other Easterphora species in having two teeth. It was all thought to be Easterphora barbula, but was remarkably variable. At the very beginning, it was known that there were sharply keeled forms forms with weak teeth, forms with strong teeth, blunt forms that got very big. The ribbing on the shells varied. The relative size of the umbilicus varied. And it seemed that more than one thing was involved, but mysterious about how many and how you should split them up. The more material that I saw and that Alvaro kept sending, the worse it seemed to get. Fortunately, a quick answer, it seemed, came out of dissecting them with a very distinctive character emerging quite quickly 
in the distal genitalia. The forms with ke strongly keeled shells, which are shown in A and B at the top, had a long penis, but also a long epiphallus going off it. The forms with blunt shells had a rather shorter penis, but with a disproportionately small epiphallus. And this seemed to work more or less across the board. There were very few adults that couldn't be assigned, and it was easy enough to dissect them with a bit of practice, at least the adults. Putting data from dissected specimens initially and then to others on maps, it became obvious that the keeled ones with the long epiphallus were endemic to Western Portugal, going from uh, Stubal, uh, Serra da Rabida, northwards to about Coimbra or a bit beyond, and essentially in the limestone regions, although they didn't always live on limestone. In the same area, there are also blunt shelled ones with the small epiphallus, but they went very much further, in fact, all over Portugal. They went right up to north central Spain and right down to southeast Spain in province Hayen. So the really widespread one was the blunt shelled one. Not all were clearly identifiable from shells, but most were, and certainly most populations with a good sample could be placed, but not quite all of them. The question arose really then on what was the true Easterfora or Easterfora barbula and what the other ones should be called. And that thankfully was easy, fairly easy to deal with. The type specimen of Easterfora barbula was, or two type specimens, were at Senckenberg in Germany. And very good photos arrived quickly after a request. The next oldest name that was valid was Barbella, which was from the Eastern frontier of Portugal. And the type of that collected by Savain was in Borgerignac's collection in Geneva. And that and other type material was sent willingly enough from Geneva for study. Amongst the German type material, the strikingly keeled shells from Lisbon, which is within the area of the keeled ones that we'd been studying. And that was Easterfora barbula proper. There was no doubt about it. One of the specimens, now a lectotype, has a very sharp keel and it's from Lisbon. The other one is outside the range of, the localities are outside the range of the keeled ones at a place called Myrtle, close to the Spanish frontier. They were bluntly keeled. And Barbella then becomes the oldest name for the blunt one, without very much doubt. So the type locality was fixed at Myrtle by designation of another lectotype, now back in Geneva. So the, there was a fairly neat solution to that. And finally, as a kind of postscript and still unpublished, although a paper including it is in press, Louis Chueca and Benjamin, Go uh, Benjamin Gomez's lab has DNA sequenced both of these, both the uh, Lisbon keeled material of Barbula proper and of Barbella, and also an island form that has no teeth, found all three are most closely related to each other but that not surprisingly, Barbula and Barbella behave as distinct species. They've got distinct mitochondrial DNA, DNA. And the island form with no teeth actually arises from the stem that produced the pair of them. It's confined to a couple of little islands off Western Portugal. During the time chasing around picking up more Easterfora, Ponentina made their presence very obvious. And in fact, this one was on the wall of the house we were bought, climbing up the white paintwork of the basement. It was rather odd because it had very short hairs. It didn't look like British Ponentina subvarescens at all. It was browner, it had very short hairs. Anatomically, it was fairly similar. Going to the coastal limestone, this thing appeared with immensely long hairs and almost flat and twice as big. On a hilltop near Porto Alegre was one with no hairs at all, just little, little conical hair bases. On hills to the east, the flat, small flat things with short but rather strong hairs that are usually covered with mud and very hard to find. 
And it was quite clear that Ponentina was a complicated genus in Portugal, not just the one species it was being assigned to. There are several old names. There's an old name Platylasia, for example, for this one. Others seem to have no names at all. May, we made a big effort to collect anatomical material as well as shells. This is just to show some shell hairs. I'll, I'll get back to that in a moment. But the anatomy at first sight was very troublesome. There were some that had quite complicated genitalia appropriate for, ge for a geometrid with a pair of dart sacs, pair of accessory sacs, the accessory sacs giving rise to two mucus glands, each of them. So four mucus glands in two pairs, two dart sacs. There are others that had greatly simplified anatomy. And there are also very many that were just simplified because they're immature. And it took a struggle over quite a few months to get enough adult material to really understand what was going on. And that involved a lot of rearing of immatures and a lot of false starts by dissecting immatures that couldn't then be reared on because they'd already been killed. So some that were clearly mature, they were laying eggs, had reduced genitalia. One tiny dart sack, not a pair, with no dart in the dart sack. No accessory sack, just a pair of mucus glands arising in, in the axle or in the axle of a very tiny bump that might be an accessory sack. And there were various stages of reduction in different populations. And that sort of simplified itself when very close attention was paid to the hairs on the shells. And there seemed to be two kinds of character that split the ponentina into groups. One was the character of the shell hairs, the other was the details of the reduction of genitalia. And to cut a very long story short, we ended up with, I think it was nine, in, nine species that appeared to be present in Portugal, some of them with overlapping ranges and at least four others, two of them in North Africa, one still needing a name, a couple extending into Spain from Portugal, then subvarescence, which only occurs from Northern France to South Wales. There were seven, I think, that needed new names at that stage, and there are still two that, that deserve new names where we're trying to link sequ new sequence data with the anatomy and the morphology and the dis distribution patterns. But it's a fairly desperate struggle getting material of some of the ponentina from very poor acid habitats. They live at very low density. You can work all morning and find perhaps one immature and five dead shells, or sometimes find nothing at all. So getting material that's adult, sufficient to dissect and more than just one individual proved to be very hard work. It, it took, about three seasons of field work. Looking at the results more generally from all the work on Ponentina, there's a very clear trend became obvious. There are species like Platylasia, which is the, right, quite common in the coastal plain of West Central Portugal. It's a nice big thing with big hairs. It's extremely easy to find in the right habitats which often include olive groves on limestone, where it occurs from just above ground level up to say two meters above the ground under moss on tree trunks, but also amongst rocks in field hedges and the like. It's a fairly high density, it's easy to find. A good proportion of the specimens are adult and they're nice and big to dissect. And they all have full genitalia. We've found them mating, they're clearly outbreeding, and two or three widespread species resemble that situation. There's a thing called Revelator that goes from northern France to central Portugal, a widespread one, and Ponentina ponentina, which is widespread in Portugal, has nearly full genitalia, occurs in rich habitats and often at high density. At the other extreme are a lot of small, mainly smaller species that never develop full genitalia, 
which have characteristic combinations of, of reduced genitalia parts in the different species and characteristically diff different hairs on the shell and sometimes a few other characters, each of them with a discrete range confined to, often to a group of hills. So we map these out and that helped delimit the species. A lot of them are mud covered, so which makes them even harder to find at bow density, particularly as in during the summer when you're searching, they don't move, they're all estivating. But every now and then you get a nice clean one and you can see the shell sculpture properly like this. And if you can clean them carefully, the hairs are often stronger than the shell, which is membranous. So it's a devil of a job to preserve a shell and get the body out to dissect it. But the remarkable thing about these with reduced genitalia is that almost all of them are at very low density in very poor habitats. And it seems there's a clear pattern that the genitalia have been reduced in species living at very low density in acidic habitats mainly. And an obvious reason for that, or one obvious reason, might be that there's not much point producing a dart if there's almost no calcium to make it. And also if the only ponentine of the snail is ever likely to meet are its own close relatives because of the low densities. So it seems very likely that self-fertilization is prevalent with these. Certainly some reared in isolation produced eggs in isolation and eggs hatched without them having a chance to mate. So it looks very much as though a pattern of reduction of the genitalia and selfing associated with it has allowed them to colonize very poor habitats living at very, very low densities. We're still awaiting DNA data on quite a lot of these ponentinas, but clearly from the data already available, there are several species involved showing that the basic reason for splitting them into multiple species is valid. All the North African ones though still need proper study and it may be there's more than the two species that we know about. This is a characteristic very poor habitat on a quartzite ridge in eastern Portugal. Vegetation of sit, uh, a cistus bush, bush here for example. Uh, very often heathers. The only other snail found on this ridge on two visits were a few Easterfora barbella, singletons and dead shells. And it took two visits to amass a good sample with dissectable material of the ponentina involved. And that, that was easier than some. But we were very lucky with ponentina that the genitalia gave informative characters and so did shell hairs. It made it possible without a lot of DNA sequencing to understand what was happening. And I think the reduction series in the genitalia was almost a lucky accident for the study of them. Moving on now to much smaller snails, to Truncatalina, which are generally two millimeters or less long. There's a millimeter scale here. The literature had only one Truncatalina species recognized for Portugal which was Truncatina cylindrica, which is the commonest of the two rare species in Britain, a species that has no shell aperture or teeth. That was the only one listed for Portugal and supposed to be common also in Spain. By a lot of sieving and also using material from previous work in Morocco and Algeria, and then rounding up, up all of Sebas Torres Alba's material from Spain, particularly Andalusia, patterns became clearer. First of all, the proper cylindrica was absent from Spain and absent from Portugal. The things without teeth, looking like this, appeared to be a toothless form of Callicratis, which is the rare one in Britain that occurs at Portland Bill and elsewhere along the south coast only. It differs from cylindrica in having shorter whorls that are less swollen. It's subtle, it can be as big as cylindrica, but the subtle difference in the world profile with good, good adult shells remains. You can see here, these worlds are really rather flat in Camera Lucida drawings, 
At the side of it here are more toothless calicrates with the bulging shell walls characteristic and here. More helpful was that a lot of populations had adult calicrates with only very weak teeth and included shells with no teeth at all, suggesting development of teeth was only partial, whereas others had three good but small teeth. And then there was something different again, which was like a kind of super calicratus, but short and fat, with whopping great teeth and even more swollen worlds. Looking closely at the two teeth of this one, it had a very long blade-like parietal tooth, and it often coexisted with Calicratus in Portugal. So it clearly wasn't Calicratus. You could sort them into two, all the adults and most of the immatures into two piles. Now, this thing, which I'd known about for about 30 years, suddenly gained a name. I was a bit slow doing something about it, unfortunately. The name was Trugtalina Beckmanai, named from Minorca and validly named. There was no problem with the description. And I, the Minorca shells, of which I was given a couple, are more or less identical with those from southern Andalusia and identical from, with those from the Algarve and from central Portugal. So Trunctalina beckmanii now emerges as a West Mediterranean endemic species. And remarkably, it's missing from North Africa, or at least very rare because a lot of North African samples didn't produce any. It, it seems also not to occur in Eastern Spain, which is surprising, but Torres Alba material covered a lot of sites in Spain. So if it does occur there, it's going to be rare. Calicratus, with and without teeth, is much more widespread. It gets to the edge of the Sahara in both Morocco and Algeria. It gets to Dorset, it goes down through France, and in fact, it gets to Greece in the East, but I haven't really worked properly on material from Southeastern Europe. The this particular map shows shells where most have three teeth as adults with filled black dots, shells with no teeth at all as open dots, and a little dot in the middle of mixed populations. And there's a fairly sharp cutoff within Portugal where the Algarve mainly has toothless ones. The central Portuguese ones are almost all toothed as adults. And in North Africa, they're mainly untoothed, but with a few toothed and a few mixed populations. But it seems pretty clear it's all one species. Moving on now to Sicilioides, the small subterranean snails represented by Sicilioides acicula in England. They live underground, they're blind, you see there are no black eye spots, so any eyes that are present are surely not functional. And they don't normally come to the ground surface. Portuguese shells are very variable, even more so than in Britain or France. There's typical Sicilioides acicula that you can see at the top which look like the British ones. There are some bigger ones. There, there's a, a, a rather slimmer one in the Algarve and another swollen one in the Algarve, which is actually very similar at first sight to the biggest Sicilioides acicula. A sort of breakthrough came when all the adult shells had been sorted and an effort was made to sort the really small immatures, which are fragile, tricky little things with usually dirt in the shell mouth. But when they were cleaned up patiently, mo many more characters appeared by looking at the juveniles. Sicilioides acicula as a juvenile only has one blunt columella tooth. This one, which has a name Barbosi, an old name, has three teeth, which are very pronounced in small immatures like these. And Sicilioides clessini, another old name, has definite additional teeth as immatures, but they're low and small. But, but it do, these teeth do distinguish it from Sicilioides acicula. Efforts to get anatomy from Sicilioides were troublesome to say the least because they're very tiny. This is a one millimeter scale. And this is Sicilioides barbosi, 
and basically dissecting it, dissecting it consists of little more than fixing a specimen and squashing it while pulling in two directions with two very fine needles. And every now and then something useful can be seen. But eventually a decent dissection appeared and the, the bigger clessinae was easier. The Sicilioid is a sicular anatomy, has a club-shaped penis, the bursa copulatrix duct inserting high on the vagina towards the inside of the body, and a thin vas deferens all the way along its length. The other two have a more elongate penis, the bursa duct inserting lower down the vagina, and a more or less thickened vas deferens. They already had an old subgenus name, and it looks as though that subgenus might well be valid. Plotting the distributions of the three types discloses that barbosae and clessinae are Algarve endemics. They often coexist, they occur under the same stone sometimes, so they're pretty obviously distinct species because they coexist, let alone the differences between them. A sicular is the one that gets over most of Europe in temperate regions. It has an Algarve locality where it coexists with Barbosae at the same site, but it's much more widespread into central Portugal. But it seems fairly neat and tidy that using a combination of anatomy that was hard to get and the characters of juvenile shells, they can be split up fairly convincingly. It's apparently much more difficult in Italy where they're very variable. And I think the view is still that most Italian ones are still very variable Sicilioides acicula. But maybe in the end, if enough material can be obtained, molecular studies will shed more light. Moving on now to some more intractable problems with the genus, what used to be the genus Candid. Candidula. It was revised in 1994 by Eddie Gittenberger, who tidied things up a lot using old specimens and a few batches of shells, but he had very little anatomical material and geographical coverage wasn't very good. Nevertheless, he left a tidier situation than that from the 19th century. It was a fluke that the first distinctive candidula we found was a second keeled one because only Cetobelensis and Cet near Cetobel, the long, the well-established keeled one has otherwise been found in Portugal. All the others are more or less conical or rounded conical. There's a very distinctive Algarve endemic candidula codia that's unproblematical. But otherwise, a very complicated mass of similar looking, but rather variable relatives of candidular intersector. We collected hundreds of samples far and wide. It wasn't difficult to get lots of material and good material suitable for dissection, but dissection didn't actually help very much. There's only one character that varied usefully across the genus at least across the Portuguese ones. And that's the length of the pineal flagellum, which is short in candidular intersector, for example, but long in some of the Portuguese populations. It's likely to be an important character for control of fertility and interbreeding because the flagellum is where the tail of the spermatophore forms, which is important in sperm transfer during mating and the length of the tail will affect where the sperm are liberated in the mating partner. So it probably does control fertility. And some populations of shells consisted of two things, one with a long pineal flagellum, one with a short one. So there was a priori case that two species were, might be involved. And often the shells could be sorted despite them being very subtle into two heaps corresponding to the type of pineal flagellum. During this time, Louis Chueca in the University of the Basque Country was finishing a PhD on all candidula. And that and his postdoctoral work showed in fact that candidula proper consists based on DNA sequencing only of 
uh, just one French species and a few close relatives of it. None of the Portuguese species belong in the restricted genus Candidula. They form a completely separate clade. And knowing so a lot of other geometrids in between, there's Helicella italla here. I know you can't read the names. Uh, Cernuella aginica, Cernuella vegeta, a whole lot of other genera. So the genus Candidula really needs to be dismembered. And a lot of the Portuguese ones and most of the problems now end up in the genus Ceraplexa, for which the type species is, is a killed one, it's Cetabalensis. So we have a complex within Ceraplexa. And in fact, we have Ceraplexa intersector now. We're forced to use that name. And Gygaxii needs another genus of its own, which is now Bacogea Gygaxii, a monotypic genus. And there are yet others for Italian species and Moroccan species, including some as yet unnamed. The species that uh, three, four years ago we named from shell characters from Portugal, additional to those recognized by Gittenberg, are three or four of them all come out as separate clades in the latest DNA tree which is this one, the latest one to be printed out. And there's a rather more shocking discovery that there are still more clades without names, but with almost no shell characters and apparently no anatomical characters at all. So work is ongoing to decide just how many are worth naming. It doesn't seem worth naming species that are completely cryptic except from DNA characters. But it's going to be a very delicate balance to decide what, what is really worth naming in, in what is obviously a very complicated genus. It's also complicated because a lot of them have been carried around as anthropogenic introductions, even within Portugal. They get carried around, for example, with horticultural plants. Finally, a few bits of recent updates for what, what has been happening and is happening in Portugal. The Albuquerque de Matos book was finally published in 2019, but it was 10, 10 years out of date and not revised when it was privately published in 2014. It takes no account of recent work. And unfortunately, her collection at the University of Coimbra shows that a very large proportion of her material is misidentified, including species known since the 19th century being misidentified. So it's not actually very useful it did provoke us to produce a comprehensive checklist published in Iberus uh, a couple of years ago that basically corrected a lot of the errors and brought the taxonomy as up to date as we could get it. There's been work at the Lucifon University in Lisbon by Gonzalo Calado and his students and colleagues on the two keyword Zeroplexes, as we must now call them, Cudensis, and this one, Cetabalensis, the, the endemic known in the Serra de Rabida for a long time. Both have very small ranges. Both are potential red list species. And they in fact found that no more than vulnerable status is necessary for either of them. Intensive surveys involving teams of students located a lot of living populations there's a big fire risk in the ranges of both of them, but the habitat is so fragmented by bare limestone, and there are so many niches in limestone crevices that it's difficult to see a fire or any other factor causing rapid extinction of either population. So they're less endangered than might, than might have appeared to be the case, but it's useful to have clear evidence for that. With Rui Mendes and taking on also Alvaro de Oliveira's data, we've started a mapping scheme. And this is the current state of mapping post 2000 by 10 kilometer UTM grid squares. The red dots are those with 30, 40, 50 species per square. Yellow dots uh, generally in the teens and up to the twenties. The blue dots have only a handful of species. And it's clear immediately that the limestone areas are the rich areas. It's also clear that they're the well-known areas. They're near the traditional seats of learning at Lisbon and Coimbra. There's more old data for the Porto region, 
but less recent data. Most, a lot of this actually being Alvaro's data. A very poor data relatively for the Algarve, although we've made recent efforts to fill the gaps. It genuinely isn't as rich in species as parts of the West. And then the whole of the East on the Paleozoic bedrocks is really very poor. It's discouraging to say the least to look for snails in a lot of these squares. There are a lot of 10K squares where a day's work would probably yield three or four land snail species. And probably two of those would be, oh, uh, land gastropod species, two of which might be slugs, two snails. And it's not encouraging if what you find is, is for example, cornu and ruminer as all you get, which are obviously widespread things. It takes targeting of very good undisturbed habitats on rocky slopes often to get the endemic ponentinas and other more interesting things. So there's a vast amount of survey work to be done. There's more taxonomy to be done and some DNA sequencing tackling it now. But there is still quite a bit of scope for exploration. There's an oxychylus still to be described from the Midwest here. There's definitely a little ponentina from up here to be described, but we're waiting for sequence data. So there's more to be done. A red data book now is in preparation, which includes this mapping data. And it's part of a wider effort paid for by the Portuguese government to map to red list invertebrates. And there is some funding appearing within Portugal for new surveys. But the COVID epidemic has complicated those, although a bit it has now become possible. That's all I want to say now. Thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take questions in due course. I've stopped sharing now, Imogen. Okay. okay. Stop sharing. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Martin, thanks. Right, thank you very, very much, David, for, for your talk. Um, before we, well, we'll round things off, we'll have go straight into the questions then. So if um, there I have are- a, I have a question. Right. Okay, Aidan. Yeah, hi, hi, David. Uh, Angel, you talk very much. Um, I work with the snails of Western Turkey and um, Ceciliodes is a very common uh, genus there. And uh, you mentioned that they're subter subterranean, but their sh empty shells are very common in surface material. Mm -hmm. uh, so there must be some way the empty shells come up to the surface. Um, over the years, I have collected many, many empty shells, but I've never found a live snail. So w where do you find them? You, you. Uh, obviously dissected some and you obviously yeah. must have found some. Well, we, we, how, how does one find the empty, uh, the, the live snails? Yeah. Uh, with difficulty is probably the, the, the general comment, but the, there's one circumstance that helps a lot. That is to go out after prolonged wet weather, where the, when the, the water table has risen nearly or, or to the surface and turn over big flat rocks, the bigger okay. and deeper, the better. If you can only just move it, the chances are best, and then look in the damp soil underneath. Okay. The, the live snails rise up to the rock and seem to stop at the interface between the rock and the soil, but only okay. under the wettest conditions, which generally means winter in Portugal. Even okay. in dry, dry hilltops in the Algarve, that worked, but in the wettest weather and with big rocks. Okay. Okay. You, you're shif shifting rocks that you couldn't possibly lift, but you can just tip. Okay. Can I tip. just add to that? Because yes. people might be moved. I have uh, excavating a Roman villa in England. I turned over at about, um, oh, six, eight inches below the surface, turned over an old roof tile, and underneath are about 50 live Siciliodes yeah. just there. So again, you say under rock, but this was dry. It wasn't wet. Yeah, you you, you were lucky. Yeah, <laughs> I've done a lot yeah. of sieving, I've done a lot of sieving, and like like uh, Aidan, I've very many empty shells.
Yeah. Most of the records from central Portugal are empty shells of Sicilioides acicula. The yeah. easiest place to find them is in river deposits and stream deposits, of mm. course. And from a small stream, they're at least partly localized, but not alive. The, the sieving is very hard work if you're trying to get anything alive. Mm. By the time you've dried soil enough to sieve it easily, they're likely to be dead or right up in the apex anyway. And on some occasions I've found possible live ones, put them in a tube of water, and two days later, they, they have indeed shown themselves to be alive, even though most of the shell had no body in it. They've obviously rehydrated from right up in the apex. But it can be very hard work. Yeah. Thank Are you. There any, sorry, have you finished there? Yes. yes I've Thank you. Those. Are there any other questions? Uh, well, I'd yes, like to Richard. Ask... Sorry, oh, Richard, I can see you waving. I can't see where Richard is. Are you there, Richard? Right. Is it Richard? the top? I can't hear you, Richard. You need to unmute, Richard. Richard. Unmute, uh, Richard, ask to un unmute. I'm that's unmuting it. now, am I? Yes, that's yeah. good. Thank you, Richard. Good. Carry on. So I, I was going to ask you about whether you found two of my favourite ones, uh, Lyostyla and Spermidea. Have you found those yes. often or occasionally? Or? Lyostyla has turned out to be common. Mm -hmm. it, it won't get into the red list. There's no question about that. It, no. it, it's least concern. Yeah. With any decent woodland almost will produce it. Most mm -hmm. old eucalyptus plantations nearer the coast will produce it. Mm -hmm. In the humid parts of the country, you'll find it easily. I think there are no, re I think there are no records from the Algarve. The southern limit in Portugal seems to be the Serra da Rabida. But then all, all, of the, all of the western half of the country is quite easy to find. Spamodia, on the other hand, now has about, I think, 10 or 12 localities is distinctly harder to find. He likes good places with rich associated faunas. And it's to some extent mysterious what it wants. It, one of Alvaro de Oliveira's localities is in gardens at Coimbra. And one of the best localities, which is also due to him, is in a mature eucalyptus plantation on a stream bank with, with uh, 30 meter eucalyptus robustus, but in a, in a, on coastal sand. Other sites are in really rich native woodland, but really rich native woodland will not produce it on many occasions, even on limestone. So it's, so it's rather elusive with a lot, of, a lot of sieving, a lot of field work, not producing many. There's one site where it extends well out of woodland and, and the brambles on a slope, and you wonder what it's doing there. So knowing where to look is difficult, but rich places are probably the ones to concentrate on. That will probably get into, into the red list as vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. Um, I've got a couple of questions, if I, if I may put two together, um, David. Yes. First of all, just can you remind me how many land snails, the total number of species in Portugal, and secondly, how much, obviously, in, in the United Kingdom and Ireland, a lot of um, work is done by amateurs. How much amateur interest is there in Portugal? Uh, there's a figure, it's pushing 200 now for land plus freshwater species, with, with about seven recent discoveries since the checklist two years ago. Things clarified partly as a result of the checklist. I think about 150 of those are terrestrial. That includes introductions, incidentally. The uh, malacologists are rare. There are two obvious professionals, really. One working as a consultant, mainly for government departments, the other a busy professor within Portugal. There are, there's one other act, really active amateur, which is Rui Mendes, who's well and truly in harness, doing as much work as he can. And th there's a need for more recruits, really. Part of the problem is that there's no good identification book. 
the big book for all of Spain and Portugal, published a couple of years ago. It is probably the main thing to use, but it, it has all the Spanish fauna, so it's difficult. So is, is a, are you working on a, a book for Portugal, aren't you, David? Well, there, there's talk of one. There's some work being done in February to get a lot of photographs for the Red Data book. And the condition of taking those has been that copyright can be reserved also for a guide. So there are fewer photos needing filling in. There's an interest from uh, Joachim Rice, the consultant who has worked a lot on freshwater bivalves to be involved. And possibly it would involve Rui Mendes and myself now. There are no very definite plans for it, but there is, there is some enthusiasm for doing it. And poss possibly as a separate Portuguese book and an English book with distribution. And also it would be a vehicle for distribution maps. Yeah. Yes, clearly that would, would be a big help in getting more amateurs involved. Yes, I think it would. Yeah, yes, yeah. That, that and some simple keys and just good illustrations. Yeah. Collecting all the illustrations together from published papers would be a start, and then we need to fill the gaps. Right, thank you. Are there any other questions from anybody? Jerry, I saw a hand, Jerry Robbins. Oh, right. Yes, Pat, yes, I was just trying to bring up the title of a book I've got. It's giving me page 74 for some reason in my reading list. Um, about terrestrial snails in Spain and rather than trying to work my way through all these pages, oh that might do it, it's called, nearly there, there we go, that's it, Caracoles Terrestres de Andalusia. Yeah, I have the same books. Yes. Uh, I, I they're small, that, small but, format guides illustrated mainly with photos. Yeah. They're fairly comprehensive. They, they, it was intended to cover all of the former helicidae of Andalusia, everything edible. That was the, the main really? for publishing it. <laughs> okay. Also, lots and lots of smaller things, thankfully, were added yes. as well. And the coverage, <laughs> is the coverage is most complete from everything that used to be in the helicidae. Yes, it's, it's very, very good, very with all the photographs, and um, it would help if I'd been able to speak Spanish, of course, but um, you can... It's, ge it's generally quite sound, but it doesn't include yeah. slugs. It's a bit out of date now, and yeah, it's so not really just be useful. It's a sort of a useful guide. It is just, it, but just in Andalusia, it's not, well, it's no use at all in other parts of Spain, or very little use. No, because the, the, obviously the um, terrain... Yeah, the faunas are very different elsewhere. Rather different. It's um, very much desert down there. Well, the, the, it covers all of Andalusia, so it, it covers, for example, Malaga and the hills behind, it covers oh, yeah. Seville. It goes all the way along. It's not just the very dry bits in Murcia in the east. Mm -hmm. It yeah. does go, go most of the way across. Yes. We there's there's, there's, there's wooded there. country and mountains in, in a lot of it. Mm -hmm. it's, quite, mm -hmm. they, quite, it's quite difficult, I find, to sort of identify individual species. You're know, so sitting, sort of sifting through all these pictures. Uh, but um, I did get there in the end with the one I was looking for. So I bought a whole book for one species. <laughs> yeah, it did partly depends on the look of the draw, which one you get. If you get Geometry D, it would be difficult because there are a lot of them and they can be rather similar, as well as variable. Others yeah. are fairly easy. Yes, yes. The very, big, the very big helicids are fairly easy, for example. Yeah. As I say, we were in the Cava de Gata and there's one snail which is virtually endemic there. Yeah. I found those and I was really quite pleased with myself. But it, that, that's a very poor arid area with serpentinoid yeah. rock, so th there are very few snails there. Yeah. And the big white thing you probably found, Sphincterochyla candidissima. That's it was fairly easy. About the Popping size great of, white thing, like a marble. The size of a fingernail. No, it'd be one of the. Yeah. Yeah. I think you probably had a geometrid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. Are there any more questions from anybody? I can't see everybody's faces, so I might miss. No, I can't I think... see any hands up now. No, I think that's pretty much it. Right, now what I'd like to do now um, is for everybody who's listening to unmute themselves. So if you've been muted, unmute now, please. I can still see some mutes, right? So unmute.